maybe that fixed it? Hey folks, you seeing me, hearing me? So weird, I think that that, I think it is actually live now. Um, <clears throat> my apologies folks, I had no idea why, why, why in the world um, it was not going live. It would just, I would set it to go live and it would just freeze and uh, nothing would happen. But, hi y'all. Welcome, uh, welcome to a another Esoterica live stream. Um, wow, I am uh, I'm a little out of it, uh, to be honest. Um, uh, some folks uh, might know that I've been away in the Yucatan for about 10 days now, and I just got back at 1 a.m., this morning and then got up at six to take care of the kids. Um, so I'm a little exhausted, but uh, I'm really excited to hang out with you all, uh, take some questions, talk about some recent episodes and just hang out. So um, um, my apologies again for the the technical issues um, that we were having there for a second. It's super weird. It would um, It would just not go live. And then I reset my laptop and uh, now, now it appears to be live. So when in doubt, just reset all the things. Um, I think about that with reality. Uh, sometimes I look at reality and think, wow, this is really messed up. Someone should just hit the reset button on all of reality. And unfortunately, I don't know there is a reset button on reality, but um, I bet that would fix some things if we had one. So thank you so much again for uh, for taking the time out of your Friday afternoon to come hang out with uh, a weird guy that makes weird videos for the internet. Um, I'm Justin Sledge, um, and uh, I make weird videos for the internet. I think that's my job. That might be my the official way I describe my job. So um, very happy that um, that you're joining me. We can hang out. We can um, we can um, we can talk about some some esoterica, and um, uh, yeah, I can talk a little bit about my my recent uh, my recent trip to the Yucatan, which I said I just got back from last night or the early this morning. So it's been um, been a um, been a bit of a, a bit of a long day, but I uh, hope all of you are well. Hope all of you have been uh, taking care of yourselves. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about some uh, some of the stuff we've been doing on the previous episodes here at the channel. It's been a really really fun past couple of weeks on the channel. I've gotten to cover a couple of things that I really really enjoy. Uh, the episode on um, Plato's mystical mathematics, uh, specifically as it kind of trickles up into Neopythagoreanism, or really how both Plato and Neopythagoreanism are drawing on the same sources. I think I could have made that a little clearer, actually, in that episode. I think that's one of the mistakes I made, and I wish I would have um, been clear about that, that they're not Plato, that the theology of arithmetic is not an extension of Plato's secret teachings, but rather Plato's secret teachings and the theology of arithmetic are probably drawing on uh, a shared um, treasure house of um, of sources, so I could have made that a bit clearer in that episode. But um, that was a really fun episode to make, and I think it went over really well. And um, so it was really cool to dive into some of that stuff. If folks have never checked out the theology of arithmetic, especially if folks who are interested in more medieval Renaissance style um, occultism, a la someone like Agrippa, the theology of, of arithmetic is a really important place to uh, to really understand that text and to really understand, uh, especially the second book. Of occult philosophy, which is there. Um, so, um, so again, uh, really fascinating text uh, there. Um, what else did we cover? Oh, we looked at some George Bataille, a philosopher who's had um, some impact on me, although I think less and less over the years. Um, I actually just picked up the Michael Surya intellectual biography of Bataille, who uh, is really, really, um, you know, sort of really fascinating um, thinker, a huge impact, although I don't think he's terribly well known in a lot of other circles, but um, but really looking forward to, to maybe going back into some Bataille later on. Hey there, Philip, I see you in the uh, in the chat. Hey, buddy, um, looking forward to looking at your, your episode on Sufi music. Um, Folks may know that uh, Phillips over there at Lex Talk Religion, one of the uh, one of the best religious studies channels uh, on on the tubes. So Philip, um, it's good to see you, man. Uh, looking forward to maybe working on this um, this uh, Maimonides collaboration. Should be a lot of fun. Um, so what else? What's the other episode we did? We did Bataille. We did Plato. God, there's such a weird range of things. Um, 
What was the other thing that we worked on recently? I can't even remember how I produce these episodes so quickly. Sometimes I forget even the content I'm making. Ah, yes, the treasure magic episode. Um, the treasure magic episode was a lot of fun to make. That I mean, that episode was just sort of pulled directly from on my childhood imagination, and it was a, a ton of fun to work on that episode. So I hope um, I hope that episode actually would be really helpful and really useful to like DMs out there, anyone who played Dungeons and Dragons or other kind of tech uh, uh, games like that. Um, I really hope that would be useful because, um, I think one of the really fun things about what well, we're already talking about Dungeons and Dragons are like 10 minutes into the stream. Um, one of the things I think will be really useful for making role-playing games really, really, um, uh, dynamic is actually grounding them in rules that are historically available to us. And, uh, I think one of the more interesting rules that, um, that historical treasure hunting had that the D and D treasure hunting doesn't typically have is that um, the treasure is actually, um, in historical magic at least, is some, some, somehow self-conscious of the fact that you're trying to find it, and it doesn't want to be found. And I think the idea that it will run away from you is that I absolutely love the idea that the treasure is sort of waiting in the ground, and the moment you try to go dig for it, it's like, uh -uh, I'm, I'm taking off. Um, and I really love the idea of the treasure is trying to elude you at the same time that you're trying to find it, and that you have to... Um, you have to use uh, further magic, counter magic, to actually get the treasure. I think that that stuff is really, really fascinating. So it's been uh, it's been a really fun couple of weeks here, uh, over at uh, over here uh, in Esoterica Land. Um, you may have noticed that the treasure magic treasure magic episode and the as a, the Batai episode actually made was the same week. I made those episodes both back to back. It was a little bit of a hustle because I knew that I'd be away in the Yucatan for ten days. And I would have no time to actually work on content there because, you know, vacation is supposed to be vacation. Um, and so I kind of like ram those into one week and it was a pretty, pretty heavy lift to get both those out. But um, I'm really um, yeah, looking forward to, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting back on to uh, uh, working on some of this material. So uh, I have a lot of cool stuff, uh, a lot of cool stuff in the, in the docket, uh, including an episode, I think next week on Austin Osman Spar. So for folks who are interested in um, the philosophical origins of chaos magic, I'll be looking at um, uh, at um, some of the philosophical ideas of Austin Osman Spar, uh, and I'll be doing that with a, with a cool collaboration, someone you probably can guess who I'll be working with, uh, a dear friend of mine and colleague. So we'll be working on Aust Austin Osman Spar next week. So, um, yeah, it's been a ton, a ton of fun. And uh, I brought a cool thing back from the Yucatan I want to talk about. Um, who is, um, yeah, I want to talk about a cool thing I brought back from the Yucatan. I'm not a souvenir buyer, but I got something um, I think pretty cool. And I want to share it with you guys uh, here in just a little bit, maybe about an hour into the stream. About an hour and a half, two hours today. So, all right. So let's jump into some questions. Let's have having come some conversations and... Uh, yeah, let's just have some fun. Let's just have some chats. I'm really looking forward to spending some time hanging out with you guys. All right. So Corey T, thanks for the five dollar donation. Asks, who is John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt? Um, I don't know, but I believe his name is also my name. Sorry. Uh, who is he in real life? Is there was there really a John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt? Um, I don't know, but his name, John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt, uh, these kinds of really long, ridiculous German style names. The, um, I always like Paracelsus's name. Folks know Paracelsus's sort of full name. It's like Philippus Aureolus, um, Philippus Aureolus, Paracelsus von Hahn. There's some bum, yeah, Theophrastus von Bastus von Hahnenheim. He has this incredibly wonderful, long, complicated name. So, um, uh, also, there was a, a person uh, connected to the Voynich Manuscript, who's sort of in the world of Rudolf II, uh, who I think the Voynich, no, Voynich Manuscript passed through his hands. There's a great, uh, there's a great guy named Johannes Marcus Marki, uh, Johannes Marcus Marki, and I can't. Every time I see this guy, when I was studying the Voynich Manuscript really closely, I would always see this guy's name, Johannes Marcus Marki, and I would always think Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch somehow had something to do with the Voynich manuscript. So that is what I, uh, that is what goes through my mind. Uh, 
when I think about John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt, so Johannes Marcus Markey, one of the people associated with the morning manuscript and how that connects to, 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 to Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch. All right. Um, yeah, so let me jump up to the questions from the top. Um, uh, let me jump up from the questions up here from the top. Um, all right. Um, so any specific recommendations on uh, of Pythagoras and Plato and mathematics? Um, I think that the book that I would really recommend the most in that regard is the, the stuff by... Um, by uh, Dylan, John Dylan on the Middle Platonists, who covers the Neo Pythagoreans, um, and there's also a great Neo Pythagorean reader that that tackles some of this stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. I think those would be the, the the texts I would gravitate toward the most. Folks may know this, but very little Pythagorean literature survives. We have fragments of Pythagoras, some stuff we don't even know if he really said. Um, very little Pyth Neo Pythagorean texts, so like people like Philolaus not much survives. We, you can put basically everything um, written by a Pythagorean in sort of one little volume and that's it. That's all it survived. It's sort of a bit like uh, Stoicism in that way. Nothing by many of the original Stoics, you know, Ketium or Chrysippus or whatever, none of that stuff survives. And so because so little survives, um, all we have is fragments and testimony and things like that. And so um, Pythagoreanism is also very poorly attested in terms of primary sources. So there's just not much. There's not much. Um, and on top of that, um, they couch a lot of their ideas in very abstract mystical philosophy. So really getting a sense of what's going on in that stuff is so very unusual. And we have a lot of it coming from Diogenes Laertius, <coughs> excuse me, who he can't be trusted for anything. Oh. Diogenes Laertius is like TMZ for ancient philosophy. Uh, it's just like basically a gossip, uh, gossip network. And so, so little of what he wrote is trustworthy. And, you know, we have this stuff about not eating the beans and not urinating facing the sun. And these could have some esoteric meaning, but we don't really know. They could have even weird political meanings, the beans thing. But it's amazingly obscure and it's going to unfortunately remain that way. We're never going to have a real big impact on that stuff. We're not going to have a, we're not, unless we recover some Pythagorean text, it's going to remain pretty opaque. Silent Mandible asks, where might Heraclitus fit into alchemy and esoteric philosophy? And as an early dialectical philosopher. Yeah, there's, there's some thinking of him as a sort of an early dialectical philosopher. Um, um, and he certainly has that kind of operate. He sort of, his truth is arrived at through paradox and things like that. So in that way, he certainly could be fit into the idea of a kind of um, early dialectical philosopher. Um, he certainly admired in texts like the Turbo Philosophorum, uh, that is to say the, the um, cacophony of the philosophers, uh, as an important founder there. Um, but again, Heraclitus is a bit like Pythagoras in this way. We have a handful of, of uh, things attributed to him. We have a, a bunch of really weird, opaque, very strange comments he makes and deriving a systematic philosophy from that is basically impossible. So did he have an impact on, on alchemy more in kind of what he represented than in his actual ideas? Um, because so little, again, we know so little of what he actually thought and he, and even in his time, he was notoriously opaque. He was known to be uh, an obscure thinker. And so even in his own time, he was known to be obscure and strange and cantankerous, uh, bellicose even. And so by the time we pick him up centuries later, especially by the time of the rise of Islamic alchemy or alchemy in the early uh, Greco-Egyptian world, there's so little that we can put together about uh, what his direct impact would have been. But because he's one of these philosophers that thinks about what the fundamental nature of, of nature is, uh, the RK, he wants to know what the the RK of Fusis is, what is the, the fundamental thing of Fusis, of nature, insofar as he's one of these philosophers that is interested in the, the nature of, of Fusis and the nature of the RK of Fusis, the fundamental thing that is, um, alchemists certainly gravitate toward him and kind of pick him up as a patron saint or one of the patron saints, even though, again, exactly what he thought, aside from things that are made of fire and listen to the logos instead of listening to me. Uh, it's very difficult to tease out what he, what his concrete 
uh, systematic beliefs were, if he had any, if he had any. All right. Um, a lot of text in Syriac. Where are where can I find them? Probably in libraries in Syria. Uh, I think my understanding is that uh, Tony, that most of the manuscripts that we want to deal with that are in Syriac. I think many of the manuscripts have never even been have never even received modern academic editions in Syriac. They are still in uh, manuscript. So I think a lot of those were still probably located in the Middle East um, and to the libraries over there. So that's how deep the archival work that needs to be done in a lot of this material. Um, and again, this is going to sound crazy and maybe shocking to people, but I'll give you another example that's less far afield. And, and the question that Tony is asking is about, uh, uh, last time I said one of the big things we need work done is, is Syriac stuff. Um, we we have a lot of understanding of the ancient Greek world. We have a good-ish understanding of the Arabic world, but there is a Syriac interlude that very, it's like a, I call it the Syriac fog. It's so difficult to know what's going on in that period after the end of the classical world the late classical world and the uptake of that world into um, into the Islamic world, there's a Syriac interlude that lasts several hundred years. And exactly what goes on there is a complete mystery to me. <coughs> now, I don't read Syriac. Um, and um, so it's really difficult to get an idea of what's going on there. But we know that there was all kinds of uh, philosophical development, occult development, all kinds of translation stuff going into Syriac before it ever went over into Arabic. And um, that's just a big hole in our understanding of, of hermeticism and philosophy in general that uh, is going to have to get plugged at some point. And, um, but again, that's on, you know, those kinds of holes exist even in Latin literature. I think about the fact that I think of the key of Solomon literature, which is, of course, the most famous grimoire in all of Western occultism or whatever. That the Grimoire of Solomon, I think, exists in a over 150 manuscripts. I think that's right. I think that the Clavis, like the, the Clavicula Solomonis manuscripts, have a number in the at least the 120s plus. And very few of those are edited. There's no critical edition of that literature. Um, a couple of texts have been published here and there. There have been a lot of great texts published, but there's no substantial critical edition of the of the key of solomon literature and that's even literature we know pretty well and that's literature we've been documenting since at least the days of um uh the early 20th century but the syriac world i think is is a real is a real wild a wild west of manuscripts that need to be deciphered and uh published so super interesting stuff um so let me jump down. Wow. All right. Yeah, I would love to get more into learning Syriac and being able to get access to some of that stuff. Um, and, you know, there's tons of, um, to give one example, right? Um, we have a new Pythagorean tradition that goes all the way up to the late classical period and then sort of jumps into history, the Sefer Yetzira. I'm fairly confident there's some middle, there's some big link, several links in that chain that links, say, for Yetzirah back to Neopythagoreanism. I think the link to those chains is somewhere in the Syriac tradition. And we think that because of where the, the text appeared and things like that. But the trouble is we have to get access to those manuscripts, to get that stuff translated before we can establish that for sure. But my hunch is that the Neopythagorean tradition is carried on into the Syriac tradition and that the Sefer Yetzirah emerges from that. Uh, but that's still work to be done in the future. All right. Um, let's see. Let's get some other questions. Um, I saw someone else donated as well. Um, let's see. Let's scroll back up. Yeah, thank you, Salat Mandible. 499 donation. Thank you. That's really kind of you. Um, let's see. Who? Okay. Uh, Pavel. 
Noviki, Pavel Noviki, question: What is your what is your opinion? Well, who, in your opinion, is the most interesting philosopher that you totally disagree with? That's great. What philosopher do I really like that I totally disagree with? Um, who is a philosopher that I really really like but just 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 do not agree with? Probably Plato. Probably Plato. I don't accept anything Plato said, basically. Uh, I've never really accepted. I don't like Platonism. I don't really believe Platonism is true. I think that it's, you know, I think it's a mess. Um, but he's infinitely interesting. Uh, Plato, so Plato is a philosopher that I think is infinitely interesting. Uh, Heidegger as well. Um, Heidegger for similar reasons to Plato, actually. I think Heidegger is a philosopher who gets things deeply wrong, but for all the right reasons. <laughs> So he's he's a he's a philosopher that I never have gotten on board with, but it's it's he's inescapably interesting. So um, so Heidegger I think is another philosopher that I, I I think is profoundly interesting and profoundly important, but that I dis uh, I disagree with I disagree with deeply. So yeah, Plato and Heidegger I would say would be the philosophers that <coughs> that I can't uh, I can't get on board with. Um, you know, there's a there's an argument made that says that um, the direction of historical 20th century philosophy, at least continental philosophy, was going to be decided divided was going to be decided by either one of two directions: the Heideggerian direction or the Lukáčian direction. That either Lukács would carry the day or Heidegger would carry the day, and it turned out Heidegger carried the day. I'm much more on team Lukács. So, um, so if you're curious about where I would fall, who I when I say that I think Heidegger's wrong, who would I who would I tend to more agree with? I would tend to agree more with um, with Lukács uh, on that debate. There's a great book about that, um, who's the author of which is now escaping me, but the text is called Heidegger and Lukács, and he makes this really compelling argument. So that's a great question. Um, I think it was Aristotle or Fitzgerald. It all gets a muddle in my mind. Either Aristotle or Fitzgerald, I think one of them said something like, that the mark of intelligence is the ability to hold a position you don't agree with in your mind and take it seriously. And I think that that's true. I think that if, you, if you're an intellectual worth your salt, you really have to be able to hold positions that you, you have to take very seriously positions that you don't agree with. In fact, you have to take them more seriously than you take your own positions because your own positions are always easy to accept. It's always easy to accept things you already believe. It's confirmation bias at its worst. So what I actually believe and what I think anyone believes is actually disinteresting. What's more interesting is taking seriously what you don't believe and then trying to figure out and understand why you don't think it's true. I think that's a much more uh, rigorous philosophical project. And that's why I like working on Esoterica. I mean, as I, I'm sure folks know on the channel, I'm not committed to any of the beliefs that I talk about on the channel. I'm not an esotericist, I'm not a cultist, I'm not a practitioner. In fact, I don't I, I don't, I'm, you know, philosophically actually even hostile to many of the ideas that I, I talk about on the channel. And it's precise because I'm actually philosophically hostile to many of the ideas that I present on the channel that I really want to take them very seriously and present them as honestly and as rigorously as I can, because it, it who cares what I believe? What matters to me, at least, and in, in terms of my intellectual responsibility to you all, is that I present ideas as charitably as possible which means I give them the best possible read and the best possible um, presentation regardless of what I believe. And so it would be completely, I think, uh, intellectually dishonest and frankly lazy thing for me to do if I simply only presented ideas I believed in, which who cares about that? And then two, if I presented a lot of these ideas in ways that were just meant to undermine them. And if I were doing that, if I were just sort of presenting them to undermine them, I think that I would just find this work to be completely soulless. And it's precisely because I try to take them very seriously, present them as rigorously and as charitably as possible, that I have one, a, a deeper respect for them. And two, I feel like I earn my own positions when I don't agree with them. I, I earn my own positions better. So, you know, do I agree with Cornelius Agrippa? No, I don't. I don't find Cornel any aspect of Cornelius Agrippa's philosophy to be terribly uh, compelling to me, philosophically, metaphysically. But that doesn't mean I get to present him in an intellectually dishonest way. It means that I have even more of a task to present him honestly, because it's precisely because I'm trying to think through him rigorously 
and present the best version of him that I can. So I think that's a far more, I don't know, fun and soulful grasp of this material, which I do have a, a deep respect for, even if I disagree with it. So, all right, let me scroll back up and grab some more questions. Um, is there a Discord or Facebook group for the esoteric community? Um, do you mean esoteric as a channel? No. To my knowledge, I, I don't think there is a, a specifically esoterica, the channel at least, uh, Discord or Facebook, but that doesn't stop anyone from making one. Um, if you guys want to make a Facebook page to hang out on uh, or a Discord, folks are welcome to do that. Um, I don't have the time personally to, to manage it. And so uh, my opinion of that kind of thing is, I don't want to start something that I can't commit to really doing fully. And because I can't commit to fully doing it, just because I don't have the time and the resources to do it, I don't want to sort of halfway do it. And so, but does that mean that there can't be a fan page for Esoterica? Sure. Sure. Just know that there's no official one. It's not, it's not started by me. And um, so it's not, there is no one for, for me. No, at least that's not the one I, I started. All right. Um, let's see here. Uh, Ashley Dewing, question. Do you believe the Voynich manuscript is nonsense slash fake? Um, this is, a, this is a, a great question. Um, Ashley, I think that the Voynich manuscript is a medieval hoax. What that means is that I think that, there, that the text was produced in the Middle Ages, sometime in, the, sometime in Italy, probably sometime in the mid-15th century. So that makes it, it is medieval. It, it is actually a medieval text. We have lots of reasons to believe that. Now, that doesn't mean that the text means anything, which is my opinion that the that the that that there is no underlying text, which is to say it cannot be deciphered because it was never enciphered to begin with. It was always uh, gibberish. Um, and I say that because, um, I, uh, I say that for mathematical reasons. Uh, there, there, there are pretty clear mathematical indicators that the Voynich manuscript does not contain an underlying text. Um, but what's interesting also about it is that Courier discovered two different statist statistically significant groupings of, of, uh, of text. So not only, and there, there are several hands copying it. It's not like one scribe copied the whole thing. It appears that what we have are several different hands working on this. So this is a team project, group project, if you will. And it seems like the nonsense was generated by two different people using similar rules, but coming to different kinds of nonsense. So there's kind of language A, language B, but neither of which contain any actual information, uh, which is just to say there's no underlying text there. I don't believe that there's an underlying text. I could be wrong. Um, but I think the general consensus also of most uh, mathematicians and most cryptographers at this point is that the Voigt manuscript does not contain um, information. And, it, and if it does contain information, it doesn't contain retrievable information. So it could be the case that it was encoded somehow, but the encoding is not backwards. You can't read, can't decode it. So I am skeptical, deeply skeptical, that the Voigt manuscript contains uh, recoverable information, if it ever contained information at all. And I don't think it contained information at all to begin with. Um, and I can talk about that more why I believe that, but that's my my general position, is that the warning manuscript is a medieval hoax. Um, and why, who would hoax this? Who would do that? Well, someone trying to make a bunch of money. And they probably did. This thing was circulating at the court of Rudolph II, and I'm pretty sure it, 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 uh, it got a, a pretty penny when someone bought it. Um, all right. Um, Fernando Campos asks about me making a video on the Oracle of Delphi and the supposed fumes. Um, the fume theory, uh, in fact, Religion for Breakfast always has already has a really excellent recent video about this. So I probably won't be doing a video uh, about it because uh, Andrew over at Religion for Breakfast has already done a really great one. Um, the short answer is this idea, I think, was forwarded in the late classical world by uh, by maybe the Stoics and stuff who wanted a more rationalistic understanding of what was going on. Um, um, it's just the case that the fumes that come out of the earth, if they were like ethylene, uh, would not cause those kind of symptoms. And so I don't think that the the Oracle at Delphi was, um, was breathing in fumes. I don't think there were even fumes in there. Um, and I don't think that she was she was getting them from uh, from the fume. So I think the fume theory 
uh, while popular in the early 20th century, I think it's been debunked. I think it's been debunked. She's not, she's not, yeah, she wasn't doing that. So no, I don't buy the, I don't buy the, uh, the fume theory. And I think it's been widely debunked. Just like for some reason that theory continues to be popularly battered about in the same way that the ergot theory for the Salem witch trials continues to be battered about. Um, folks know this theory, right? The Salem witch trials or the witch trials in general were the result of, um, of a fungus that typically grows on rye ergot, right? And ergot, if you, uh, that fungus can, is, uh, is the precursor for the synthesis of things like LSD. And there was a theory published I think in the 1970s that ergotism was the reason for the, uh, uh, the, at least the Salem witch trials. But we now know that that ergotism could not, um, could not explain what happened in the Salem witch trials and that the symptoms of ergotism and the symptoms of the people who are so-called bewitched, uh, both in continental, continental trials, but also in the Salem trials are simply not, there's no actual strong correlation between, uh, the symptoms of ergotism and, uh, and the, the kind of behavior we saw in the Salem witch trials. Therefore, um, the ergotism theory has been dismissed now, I think, for over a decade. But it continues to be bandied about. People, you know, even the comments I get in uh, my witch trial episodes, people are like, oh, it was just fungus on rye. I'm like, no, that theory has been, that theory has been debunked for at least a decade, maybe more. So, um, so the, whatever caused the Salem witch trials or the trials in general was certainly not that and probably not one thing. It was very complicated social phenomena. Very, very complicated social phenomena. All right. Let me scroll back down and grab some more questions. Um, wow, there's so many great questions. Um, Carlos Castaneda, um, I don't have a strong opinion about him. I think he just made a bunch of that stuff up. I think that's a general consensus. Um, yeah, that it was just sort of kind of what I would call pious fraud. Um, so I think that, yeah, um, I think it would be something like pious fraud. Um, would I be interested in covering, uh, John Ivan asked, would I be interested in covering alchemy and Jung? Yes, yes, I will be interested. I am interested in doing that. Um, there's a, there's a, I want to cover alchemy and Jung and Jung's conception of alchemy. Um, but there's a way of doing it that I have to find where I need to, <laughs> what's the right way of putting it? I got to find a light touch to do it. Um, Jung is really close to the heart of a lot of people interested in esotericism. And um, the truth of the matter is that Jung's understanding of alchemy is just wrong. <laughs> he, he, he Historically, he doesn't understand alchemy. Um uh, he makes a ton of mistakes about how alchemists are thinking and how alchemical theories are changing over time. And so we learn more about Jung and Jung's ideas than we learn about alchemy through Jung's understanding of alchemy. So um, so part of approaching, um, and Jung's a philosopher also who I really appreciate and, and very strongly disagree with, um, part of what I have to do if I'm going to do an episode on Jung and alchemy is again, find a really light touch and really give the most charitable read of what Jung is up to because um, part of the problem and part of the part of the task that I have ahead of me and I think a lot of other uh, histi historiographers of alchemy have ahead of them is basically debunking a bunch of stuff that people picked about picked up from Jung and Marion Atwood and other people. And there's the idea that that alchemy is about personal self personal transformation or something, spiritual transformation. And there's just little evidence of that prior to the 17th century, really part of the 18th century. Um, you get a little bit of it in Jakob Burma and stuff like that, but not much. Um, and even that's really tightly, highly, highly controlled, highly linked to Christianity and, and to Christ and stuff. Um, um, so, yeah, so you, I, what I don't want to make is an episode that's just deflationary. I don't want to make that episode because I don't think like it's really helpful. And so it's a question of how do I do both? How do I say the truth about what we know historically about alchemy via Jung and how Jung basically uh, systematically misreads alchemy, but also not just do it in some super deflationary way. So yes, an episode on Jung and alchemy is coming, uh, but um, yeah, it's got to get to it. I need to reread Jung on alchemy too. Uh, I read him probably 10 years ago or something, and I need to reread it to make sure that I'm I'm, uh, I'm more, uh, make sure that I'm 
really up on the thing. So, all right. So, oh, Payam, thank you. Uh, thank you for your your donation to the channel. Uh, really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, um, yeah, Howard. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for your donation. But yeah, the Jungian stuff is is interesting, but yeah, it's it's a little all over the place. Um, it's really all over the place. Um, Jay Orr asks, what magical herb would you add to a beer as Gruet? What effects would you hope for aside from the obvious? I guess the obvious is being drunk. Um, beer tends to have that effect on you, at least if you drink enough of, enough of it. Um, <clears throat> what kind of, uh, see, I'm not, I don't, I don't know much about, um, I'm not an herbalist, so I can't, I don't want to get out of my field and, and go in that direction. There is a relatively good book on, um, on herbalism, I think called Sacred Herbs and Brewing. I think there's, let me check it real fast. Let me see. Sorry. I have it on my shelf, actually. It's in my brewing collection of books. Yeah, Sacred and Herbal Healing Beers, The Secrets of, um, the secrets of Ancient Fermentation. This book is okay. Um, but I have to say that I'm not an herbalist, so I, I can't um, I can't verify everything or anything in it. Um, I will say that one of the things that um, that is absolutely um, that you see in almost all gruits, actually, uh, gruits for folks who don't know, gruit is beer that's brewed not following the Reinheitsgebot. Um, that is to say, the the German purity laws they were established in whatever 1548 or something. Um, that's not true there. There, whenever they were, the Ryan's Um, and that means that beer can only be made of uh, uh grain, uh grain, hops, water, and of course yeast. Of course, they didn't know the yeast. But of course, before that, you have tons and tons of other herbs that were included in beer. The most common herb included in gruits, aside from aside from uh hops, was yarrow. Uh yarrow was ubiquitous in uh in gruits. And it gives, uh, uh, when I brewed with yarrow, it gives the beer a kind of grapefruit kind of taste, kind of, a kind of grapefruit flavor. And um, I brewed a bunch of these sort of based on Belgian triples back when I was living in Memphis. And my friend at the time, John, who was a big fan of these, uh, these like these were like 11, 12% beers made with uh, yarrow. And uh, John, my friend John was like, it's, a, it's the best combination of somehow like, uh, like beer and coffee that it gives you the sort of the up like the the jittery up of coffee but also the the kind of intoxication of uh, of beer so yarrow would be the would be the the grain or the herb rather that you would most commonly see in a gruit um aside from aside from traditional things like that so it's also used i think as a coagulant if I if I remember that correctly, that yarrow is a coagulant. That is to say, it helps to uh, to stop blood flow. Madison Thompson, uh, speaking of Jakob Berma, do you have any interest in covering him? Absolutely. I've been reading a bunch of Jakob Berma. Um, so uh, yeah, expect an episode on uh, at least an introductory episode on Jakob Berma coming up soon. Um, for folks who are curious about what I read on my vacation, because I'm a complete masochist. Um, the three books I read on vacation were one, I reread Hegel in the Hermetic Tradition. So expect some more Hegel content, uh, Hermetic Hegel com com content coming. So I read uh, the Glenn McGee text, Hegel in the Hermetic Tradition. I read um, The Early History of God by Mark Smith. That's going to be the setup for the origins of Yahweh. So expect an uh, episode on the origins of Yahweh. Um, fantastic text, by the way, The Origins of God, uh, The Early History of God by Mark Smith. And the other was a, a text on the five ages of the universe, which is a great book about how uh, the parsing the universe in terms of various stages of its of its evolution, of its development from the Big Bang all the way through um, basically the end of the universe, the heat death of the universe, which is a super cheery topic. Although I will say that when I get stressed out or uh, otherwise intellectually or philosophically bothered, um, I take great comfort in thinking that in 10 to the 100 years from now, um, after the last protons have decayed and the last uh, black holes have evaporated, uh, there'll be nothing. There'll be a vast symphony of nothing. And I take great comfort in the, uh, in the coming oblivion of the universe. So I love reading about the, the heat death of the universe. Um, 
It's like the great swan song that helps me to sleep at night. That no matter how bad things get, the heat death will obliterate all of them. So I take a great deal of comfort in that. All right. Um, let me scroll back up and grab some more questions. Do I belong to any mystery schools? I do not. I'm not. I don't belong to any occult organizations. Uh, um, I think the most occult organization I belong to is the AARL, the uh, Ham Radio Club. Um, so, so no, I don't belong to any any mystery organizations. I belong to the opposite of mystery organizations. I belong to the Ham Radio organization, the AARL. But no, I don't have. I don't belong to any mystery groups or. Um, I have a great admiration for the Freemasons, folks. I think I've said this before. I have a every Freemason that I've ever met. I've really, really appreciated. Um, um, so uh, think of my my friend uh, Reverick Eric Arnson, who uh, who I just admire a great deal. He's a great guy, and um, he's just sort of like the classic Freemason to me. I hope he's watching. I don't know if he's watching this or if he'll hear it. But uh, when I think about how cool Freemasonry is, I think of people like him and how much I appreciate people like him. But I'm not a member of any organization. Um, Andre from Transylvania. What a cool place to be from. Um, will I be getting to Simone Vey? Yes, I will absolutely be getting doing an episode on Simone Vey. Um, I got a whole Simone Vey section over there. Um, so yes, I'll be definitely be getting to her. She's uh, Simone Vey is just such a powerful, powerful figure. Um, just like she's the conscience of the 20th century. Um, people say that about Camus, but I really think of Simone Weil, at least for me, as the the beating heart of the 20th century. Whenever I feel the zeal toward whatever beliefs I have, um, reading some Simone Weil helps to put those into perspective and concretize those and things like compassion and grace. And so um, I think I've said this to a friend of mine, that Simone Weil is so difficult to even talk about because of the extreme purity that she had. Um, that she's just, um, um, I mean, she's the closest thing to a saint that a secular person could be. Like if there's ever been a secular saint, um, Simone Weil has to be it in terms of, um, uh, in terms of her, her sacredness, her holiness, her purity. Um, it'd be even cool to have like a commissioned uh, an art project of having uh, like an icon of her. She would hate that of course. <laughs> Um, but like the sort of an orthodox looking icon of Simone Vey, I think would be something that I would, I, I could easily see myself commissioning that if I had the money to commission art, but yeah, Simone Vey will definitely get to her. She's just a, a shockingly amazing, uh, thinker and woman. Um, all right. Phil Storm, you said in a video a while back that you were reading a Jewish text to talk about that there are countless demons that were around us all the time. Uh, what video was that? That was the episode on the uh, Lesser Key of Solomon, the Goetia. And um, yeah, it's just a it's just a reference to this idea in, um, at least in Jewish demonology, that the world is pretty heavily populated by demons. The cosmos is, so there are just tons of them. The Talmud says that if it, um, that the Shadim, that's the Aramaic word for the demons, and mazakin too uh, is another word for them, damagers. That if you could see them, that's all you would see because there are so many of them, uh, tens and tens of thousands all around you constantly. And so the Talmud imagines a very uh, a demonic world, a pandemonium, a world full of demons, or right? literally pandemonium means full of demons. And um, so that's the idea, at least in Jewish demonology, that demons are not sort of randomly distributed through the universe. They're kind of everywhere all the time. The universe is kind of full of them. And um, Phil, that's a, that's an idea to be found in the, the Babylonian Talmud. If you want to go look in the Babylonian Talmud where those are, it's in Tractate Berachot, which is the first tractate of the Talmud. And uh, I don't know exactly where it is, maybe Berachot 9 or 10. I could look it up for you. Um, but it's around there where they talk about um, how ubiquitous and how demon dense <laughs> the universe is, which I've always found to be really, really interesting. Um, how demon dense the universe is, at least according to the Talmud, but your knowledge may vary. Your knowledge may vary. Um, yeah, thank you, Clarity uh, Carlton, for the um, um, for the uh, for the donation. Thank you so much, uh, KT. Have you considered other potential ends for the universe? Heat death is only the one of the few likely ones. Yeah, 
Um, I mean, there's the t t there's the two, right? There's the heat death, and there's the big crunch. Um, and basically, I mean, I think I mean I'm not a physicist, so I'm not going to talk about it as if I'm a damn physicist. But it, from what I understand, from what physicists tell us, because of the the geometry of the universe and because of the weakness of gravity, it seems like heat death is the more likely than the big crunch. Um, so, you know, and also with dark energy pushing the universe, accelerating the end of the universe. That seems to be the the most likely end. Um, but again, I can only speak from my tiny, limited experience of having read some books on physics. I, I am absolutely not a physicist and don't even want to pretend to be. Um, don't even want to pretend to be. Um, let's see. All right. Well, that is, let me grab some other questions. Um, yeah, would I be interested in covering uh, Shelling? Yeah, I would have to read a lot more Shelling. Th he's one of the characters that I wish I knew a lot more about and I've not read much Shelling, so I need to do more, a lot more reading before I get into Shelling. But yes, absolutely, I would want to do as well. Uh, see, also someone, Andre mentions the Hermetic Deleuze. Yeah, I want to get to that as well, although I'm a little more skeptical of the Hermetic Deleuze book. I, I don't like that book as much as I like the, the, the McGee text. And I will say also that... Um, having reread the McGee text, I was much, much more convinced of his argument the first time I read it. The second time through, I'm much less convinced. I've read a lot more Hermeticism. I read a lot more Hegel. Boy, that's Hegel. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm much, I'm less convinced of the argument now, actually. So, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm less convinced that Hegel he certainly was impacted by some people, Jakob Burma being the big and Oettinger being the big people, but I don't, even the idea of a hermetic tradition, I'm not, I'm just not sold on. I'm not, not even sold on that. I think Walter Hanegraaff has done a lot of great work to show that that's just a, a, a it's a mistaken way for thinking about um, how hermetic ideas entered into, into, into the Western intellectual landscape beginning in the, in the 15th century. And to think of it as a tradition really, it's much more internally het, uh, heterogeneous than than uh, than than one group of ideas, and I think that um, I think that the McGee text I think makes errors there. Um, it'd be cool to talk to him more about it. Actually, maybe I can bring him on the show, bring him on the channel, and chat with him. But yeah, I'm I'm, I'm much less convinced of uh, the argument having reread re it this time, um, which is interesting. Also, I don't know if other folks have this experience. Um, when I read books, I often, you know, I, I, I'm one of those terrible people that like marks my books up, I underline and make notes and things like that. Um, and it's interesting. I think I read Hegel and the Hermetic Tradition probably 10 years ago, maybe more, definitely more. I read it before I went to, to Amsterdam. So that means I must have read it almost 20 years ago, 15 years ago. And the things that I marked then are completely not things I would mark now. So it's interesting that what I thought was important then and what I think is important now are very different things. So uh, it's just it's interesting also not only reading the book with eyes, you know, more mature eyes, maybe, hopefully, but also reading it, you know, as someone, you know, before I even studied uh, hermeticism academically. Um, now that I have and now that I've been studying it for quite some time, I, I see I see a very different kinds of things in the book. So at any rate. Hegel and Hermeticism coming up. I'm going to do it. I love Hegel. Uh, I really appreciate Hegel. Hegel's also a philosopher that I really, uh, I really, I really like, I really like Hegel a lot. Um, he's probably the most seductive philosopher to me. Anytime that I really, I feel sort of a uh, weak need or like when I'm feeling a little more mystical or like I've had a little bit too much wine or something or absinthe. I always gravitate toward Hegel. Um, there's something about Hegel and his philosophy of the absolute that uh, that the concept of totality is a concept that I've always admired and always felt seduced by. And the the category of the absolute and the the concept of totality as a philosophical concept are ideas that have always had a very 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 tight grasp on me. And and that's why I've never gravitated really toward post-structuralism or deconstructionism and all that stuff, because they're very skeptical of totality or whatever, very skeptical of these kinds of things. And those concepts have always made a ton of sense to me. Um, 
So I'm soft on Hegel um, more than I would like to admit probably, but I really, I really would like to pick up and do some more work with Hegel in the, the future. All right, let me scroll back up and grab some more uh, things. Ryan, DM or player? DM, favorite setting or published adventure? Favorite setting, Planescape. Without any doubt, I love Planescape. I love the art. The Terra Letzi is an amazing artist. I love the factions. I love the mechanics of the planar world. Um, uh, favorite class? I don't really have a favorite class since I don't play characters and I haven't played characters probably in 30 years. So I can't say about that. Although I will say that I like fifth edition bards. So you can crucify me for that. Uh, favorite edition? I don't know. I, I have my heart. AD&D. Well, you know, AD and D will always have my heart. It's my first love, but I like fifth edition. I like fifth edition. It's great. So, but yeah, I'm a Planescape guy. I love Planescape. I wish they'd reissue it. I know they're reissuing a monster manual for the planes, I think, but I wish they would just redo reissue Planescape. That's mine. That's my answer. Um, all right, let's see here. Yeah, Payam, I've only seen two series theories of sacrifice. One, Alkindi, Stellar Rays, and second, the, the Bataillon theory of sacrifice. Any thoughts of viewing these in a QFT-esque manner? Um, probably not. I mean, I mean, it's interesting, right? Because both Alkindi and Bataille are materialists of a sort. And I think that's what's really interesting about Alkindi is that he's a pretty hard, and this is, I think, what also gets him condemned by people like Al Ghazali, um, is that he's a kind of materialist. For him, the stellar rays are part of the universe. They're they're not, you you can't observe them directly, but they're they're just they're occult forces the same way gravity or strong the strong the stronger weak force are hidden forces. We can't see the strong force or the weak force, um, but they're there. They're just part of the fabric of reality. So in that way, he's not a metaphysicalist. Um, and of course, George Bataille is certainly not a metaphysicalist by any stretch of the imagination. And so could you combine them? I don't know. I don't know enough about, about Bataille's theory of physics. I, I don't know that he even wrote about physics very much. And in the 1930s, they would still be on the cutting edge of developing, um, you know, developing the, 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 uh, the standard model, um, I mean, the standard model will still be oh, quite a while out, actually. I think, again, by the 1930s, you're only like 20 years into there being for sure atoms at that point. Um, I don't know. I think you'd have a hard time. You'd have to have, you'd have a hard time because I think that Bataille is going to say that his theory of sacrifice is sort of a meta theory. The people doing it think they're doing one thing, but they're doing something else. And so in that way, he's sort of an anthropologist of sacrifice, as opposed to Alkindi, who's much more a mechanist. He's trying to describe how sacrifice enhances certain kinds of occult properties of things. And I think that Bataille doesn't believe that those properties are even there. Or if they're there, they're, they're psychological, as opposed to being actual in that way, material. So I don't know. I think you would have a hard time you would have a hard time balancing those out, but be interesting. Be interesting. Let's see some great, um, some great uh, discussions about Pythagoras in the chat about Jung. Um, I think there's no secret, right? That I'm more of a Lacan fan than a Jung fan that I'm much more on team Lacan. Um, folks after often ask me like, Oh, you like Jung? I'm like, not really, actually. I'm much more of a fan of Lacan. Who's a, as a terrorist of his own kind for, to be sure, but I'm much more a fan of Lacan than, than, um, than of Jung. But I'd like to do an episode on Lacan at some point as well. His concept of the real, I think is deeply mystical in many ways. Um, I think you can't really get into his concept of, of his, his theory of the real, the symbolic and the imaginary, I think are powerful, powerful ways of understanding uh, esotericism. It's just, it's just interesting that those tools are typically not used by esotericists, whereas typically esotericists rely primarily on Jung. But I think that Lacan could be could be marshaled in, in much the same way. Um, all right. Let's see here. Let me get some other questions. Um, 
Sean Lancaster asks, often your videos show how what we now call magic was well-grounded in the science of the day, i.e. alchemy. That's true. Is there anything you think we, quote, know now, <clears throat> which might not be true? I'm sure. I mean, it would it would just be completely shocking to me if we have things fundamentally figured out. <clears throat> excuse me. So <clears throat> I think that, excuse me. I think that any discussion about the the fundamental nature of reality or physics or what have you, there those conversations have to be extremely provisional at all times. And so, <clears throat> you know, some people say, well, your world, your worldview is basically a materialist worldview. Aren't you aware? Aren't you afraid you could be wrong? I'm not afraid I'm going to be wrong. I'm very likely wrong. And I think that when you come at these questions from the point of view that you're laboring under conditions of mostly ignorance, um, mostly ignorance and mostly very new kind of uh, discoveries that the likelihood of us being uh, like the likelihood of any of us being wrong is mostly really high. And therefore people, I have people sometimes say, well, couldn't you be wrong? I'm like, yeah, I'm very likely wrong. And that doesn't bother me in the least. My task isn't to be right. My task and the task of any um, philosopher or scientist is to work with the tools we have available to us at this point, make the best theories and the best analysis we can, knowing that we labor under an enormous amount of, 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 of bad data and poor history and lack of evidence. And we, we do a very provisional thing. And so, yeah, it doesn't bother me uh, in the least that I could be wrong. My general assumption is I'm probably wrong. It's just not wrong yet. And so my task is not to be right it, because that's maybe way too ambitious. My task is to do the best I can with the evidence I have and be humble and frank about that. So I think that's where science often, I don't know, it's to get, they get a little, they can become a little arrogant. Um, and I think that the maintaining the attitude that this is a provisional business is a, is a much more healthy attitude to have as opposed to we know you're wrong. Now, <clears throat> just because things are provisional doesn't mean that anything goes, right? So I'm a, you know, I have a, a pretty strong positivist bent. And so I, I do expect pretty rigorous testing to, to see if things are, are true. And when testing isn't possible, I'm skeptical. That doesn't mean that I just disbelieve in everything. It just means I withhold judgment. And skepticism doesn't mean I think things aren't real. It just means I withhold judgment about whether they're real. And so when someone says that they can use a dowsing rod to found gold, maybe I'm interested, but I'm my position is skeptical because unless you can do some tests to show that that is, is true beyond chance, um, my general attitude is I don't actually have a position on that. I'm skeptical, which just means I withhold judgment. And so I'm a classical skeptic in that way. It doesn't mean I go around telling people they're wrong. I don't know that they're wrong, and I don't know that you can prove that people are wrong. I don't think you can. But what you can do is I can say that until you give me really good reason to believe your claim, I'm just going to withhold judgment about it. And that means that I'm not going to believe it. I'm not going to disbelieve it. I'm just going to withhold judgment. And I think that the idea of withholding judgment is a very powerful and very, I mean, it should be ubiquitous, basically. I don't know why it's not more ubiquitous. Um, there's a ton of things I don't understand about the world. And me withholding judgment simply means I don't know. Maybe it is and maybe it isn't. And um, so that's that's the way that I tend to go about looking at these kinds of questions is that skepticism doesn't mean me going around telling people they're wrong. It means me saying, I'm just going to withhold judgment. I don't know if it's true. Don't know if it's true. Um, all right. Let me jump around and grab some more questions. Um, wow. Well, um, Let's see. Uh, how would someone go about learning Syriac? Um, uh, you could learn Syriac. I mean, it, Syriac is a dialect of it's a dialect of of Aramaic. Um, in fact, it's really similar to Eastern Aramaic, Jewish Babylonian Aramaic. Um, you would just pick up a grammar of Syriac and start reading. You can read the Bible, which is the New Testament. The Bible's been translated into Syriac. You would just need to learn to read the script and go at it. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd probably recommend learning Hebrew first then learning Syriac from that. But yeah, you certainly could. You certainly could. 
All right. Uh, Tamara, the Oracle, what are you reading now? What topics are coming up next? Oh, man. What am I reading now? I'm reading some stuff on Mormonism. I'm reading some stuff on ancient Israel. So some stuff on Yahweh. Uh, read the Hermetic Hegel. Read the book on the uh, read that other book on the the Yahwistic book. Oh man, I want to do an ep- an episode on the reviewing the various uh, translations of Cornelius Agrippa's three books of occult philosophy. So that's coming up at some point soon. Um, so yeah, a lot of great stuff. A lot of great stuff is coming up. Um, coming up soon. Um, let's see here. Let me scroll back up. Grab some more questions. Um, <clears throat> what work is being done to make uh, archive manuscripts available to the public? Are there students scanning documents, uploading them without translation for citizen translators to work at? Sure. Yeah. I mean, there are, uh, and of course, it, it's very uneven and has a lot to do with the institutions that people belong to, but there is a huge push to digitization. Um, there are tons of books that are already on archive.org and Google books that are digitized that are, have never been translated to any modern language to English or whatever. Um, manuscript digitization is slow, slower going. And unfortunately in countries like, uh, in the developing world, uh, it's much slower going. So there's a ton of Arabic, uh, digitization needs to happen. Syriac, um, yeah, there's a, a ton of digitization, and that's just in sort of the kind of Western and Near Eastern world. That's not to count, you know, all the stuff that needs to be digitized in in India and uh, Sri Lanka and Burma and stuff like that, Tibet. So it is slowly happening, um, but it's certainly picked up now even more. I mean, I, I can I've actually gotten um, I've actually gotten a good bit of access to stuff just online, where um, I'll be making an episode. There's no modern edition, and so I'll just pick up. Uh, a copy from Google Books or archive.org and I can get access to those texts there. So slowly, slowly, slowly it is coming online. But uh, again, it's much more uneven when it comes to uh, to texts in the uh, in the developing world. All right, let's scroll back up. All right. <clears throat> What time is it? Oh, it's about an hour in. Let me show you guys something cool that I got when I was in um, in Mexico. Um, so folks know that I'm a, a big fan of the classical Maya. Uh, the, I'm, I'm, you know, I say a fan. I'm, I'm really an inter- I'm really interested in cl- the classical Maya as a civilization. I'm really interested in, in their language. Um, and I had the great privilege, for the first time in my life, to go to uh, to, uh, Mayab, to the, the land of the Maya, at least in the Yucatan. And I spent 10 days there. I was just, I spent, just spent 10 days in the Yucatan. Like I said, I just got back, um, this morning at like one in the morning. And, uh, as folks probably know from the, the channel, the glyph, uh, of the channel, the sort of the logo of the channel, I guess you could say is itself actually a Maya glyph. It's, uh, uh, tzak, right. It's the, it's the image of a hand grasping a fish, and, um, and it, it's the term in Maya, it's one of the words in Maya for to summon a vision. Uh, in fact, it can be used even to, to describe bloodletting. And so I've had this long interest in the Maya and a deep respect for the Maya people. And one of the more, I think, disturbing things that continues to be said about the Maya people is that somehow they disappeared. The, the, the disappearance of the Maya is this pernicious myth um, that continues to go, you know, repeated and repeated and repeated. The truth of the matter is the Maya never went anywhere. Their, their classical civilization collapsed. They, they ceased to live in these big cities, but the Maya people continued to live in the Yucatan and other places in the highlands and the lowlands um, and continued to speak Maya, continued to write books in Maya, although often in the Latin script and not in the, uh, not in the, uh, in the, the traditional hieroglyphic script. Um, so at any rate, what it was really important to me was to, I was really happy to go to uh, the Yucatan for the past 10 days and one of the really cool things that I was able to pick up, and I'm not a big souvenir hunter, but one of the things I'm really was happy to find was this. So what you're looking at is a basically museum level reproduction of a Mayan vase. Um, 
This is actually done, was actually produced by an, an amazing indigenous artist uh, and woman, woman artist, uh, who I'll put her Instagram in the, the chat. But this is a uh, very, very high quality um, vase covered in Egyptian hieroglyphics. Now, what I have decided to do is not look up the vase. I know this is a reproduction of a historical vase, but I'm not going to look it up. And the reason why is I'm going to try to translate this myself. I'm going to take a couple of weeks and try to translate it. Let me throw her Instagram in the chat so folks can check out her work. Um, what's really cool about this art is that she is probably one of the um, one of the only Smithsonian graded uh, people who produce these kinds of exact reproductions of Maya work. And what's really cool about that, or one of the cool things about it, is that she signs her work, Patricia, using a Mayan glyph. You can see the glyph there. If I get zoomed in. Yep, you can see it. it's backwards there, but she has her own glyph. Um, so this is a, just a really cool piece of uh, of art produced in the region that um, really closely replicates um, without having to spend fifty thousand dollars on one of these. Which I'm really worried. I really don't like the idea of buying antiquities uh, in the market like this, but. This is a really cool thing. I'm really, really glad I was able to pick this up. And if you ever get your, if you get the chance to go down to, um, to Mexico, I would really recommend stopping by her, uh, her, um, her uh, shop. It's near Ushmal, uh, the Mayan site of Ushmal, and um, yeah, it's really, really, really great. So, um, so, um, all right. Uh, yeah, but yeah, folks can check out her work um, on the Instagram there. I don't have Instagram, but you can. Um, no, uh, you can check out her some of her stuff there. Um, it's really, really cool. She does really, really amazing work. Um, all right. So let me um, let me scroll back up. All right, there's some great uh, conspiracy theory people. Let me get rid of them. Goodbye. Yeah, the conspiracy theory people just blow my mind. Um, There we go. Um, all right. So let me scroll back up and grab some more questions um, as we continue on our chat. Um, yeah, some folks are asking about Mormonism. Yeah, I'll definitely be doing an episode on Mormonism. I'm really fascinated by 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 Mormonism. Uh, Joseph Smith was really a religious genius of a certain kind, and I'm really looking forward to getting into some of the the more esoteric dimensions of early Mormonism, uh, and especially his um, his connection to um, yeah, sort of occult practices and Freemasonry and stuff like that. In fact, um, I think the temple, the whole temple ritual, was basically organized around Freemasonry practices, and it was only recently changed. I think in the 1990s, maybe. Um, and so. Um, so yeah, I um, I'll be taking definitely taking a look at uh, at Mormonism at some point as well in the future. It's really fascinating. Um, so what are your thoughts on the connection of Atrahasis or Utnapishtim and the Noah story in the flood? What do you think it implies for Noah's Ark and Christianity at large? Um, the flood myth was a common myth. It's it's it's, it's a common m motif in the ancient Near East. Um, yeah, it just means that there was a common myth. There was a common myth, mytheme, and the Hebrew Bible it took part of it. And um, yeah, Utnapishtim and Atrahasis. This is sort of a common mytheme you find in in the in the ancient Near East. Um, I think if you're committed to the idea that there really was a flood, that's probably a you know that's at least a biblical flood. That's probably a problem. In fact, even the the New, the Old Testament the Hebrew Bible can't agree on the animals in in the ark. Um, one version said it was two animals. That's the one you see in, you know, Sunday schools everywhere. Um, just down a few verses down, it says uh, two of the two of the unclean and seven of the clean. Um, what does it even mean to talk about clean and unclean animals prior to the the, the theophany at Sinai? So um, 
so yeah, I think that the the text is just a it's part of the larger myth structure of the ancient Near East, and I mean there was never a flood. That's, that's a, it's a silly idea. Um, it may have a historical memory and some flooding in the ancient Near East, but I don't think that it represents a historical narrative about anything. I think it was a mytheme. Um, would you? Um, let's see, Aaron. Would you ever do any discussions on Norse magic and ritual? Um, the problem with doing stuff about Norse uh, magic and ritual, uh, at least in the ancient, uh, the, the ancient, the medieval context, the, or the, the sort of early context, is we just don't know anything. Uh, you can check out, you know, some of Jackson Crawford's stuff um, about that. And basically, what we say, what you end up saying over and over again, is we don't know. We, we know that they did things. We know that obviously they had these elaborate mythologies, but none of that comes into the historical record basically until Christianity. And so we have, uh, we have some of the mythological stuff survives obviously in the Eddas, but in terms of what the rituals look like, there's nothing. There's just nothing. Um, but you know, basically nothing. Um, so yeah, I mean, the problem with doing something on at least the historical stuff from the Norse is that, you just did not spend 20 minutes saying we don't know. Um, but yeah, maybe I'll, I'll cover something at some point, but, um, it is, it is amazing. Um, it's amazing what people claim to know, like, I don't know, Druid, the Druidism is the more famous example. It's sort of uh, the idea that you can reconstruct Druidism from the historical remains of what we know about the Druids and, you know, what we know about the Druids basically fits on one page. Um, so it's always interesting for me as a person interested in history about, how much you can reconstruct, how much people can reconstruct from such a paucity of evidence, whether it's the Druids or, um, um, yeah, the Druids or, or the ancient, uh, the old Norse people, the, the Vikings, um, or even in ancient Israel. Um, when you look back to ancient Israel, when we try to figure out what exactly, what exactly did Yahweh worship look like in, in the 10th century BCE in the kind of King David, um, uh, assuming David was real, and I think he probably was real, and we don't know much about him historically, but when you ask yourself, what did Yahweh worship look like at that point? We know basically nothing. We know very little, very, very little about what Yahweh worship looked like. So it's not just a problem of um, of, uh, of, Nor of Norse studies or Druidism. It's a story. It's just a problem of like lots of ancient religious ritual. Um uh, what did I bring back from the Chicxulub Rim? Um, I, one of the places I visited, uh, for folks who don't know, is uh, when I was in the Yucatan, I went to the uh, the what scientists think is the epicenter of uh, the Chicxulub um, crater, which is the crater that was left behind by the impact that killed the dinosaurs, um, or at least heavily contributed to the destruction of the dinosaurs. Um, I brought back a picture of me standing in front of a statue of a dinosaur. <laughs> I have a, a picture somewhere, my my wife has it, of me standing next to a they have a big dinosaur and it basically says here where's roughly where the meteor hit and it killed the dinosaur. So uh, that is um, basically what I brought back. It blows my mind that there's not just a huge dinosaur industry in the Northern Yucatan. I really feel like that if I had a billion dollars, uh, which no one should ever give me any money, but if I had a lot of money, I would build some kind of dinosaur theme park or something uh, dinosaur theme resort or something. It just seems like that would be the place. It's like the end of the dinosaurs and you could have dioramas. They still do dioramas, whatever. Um, it'd be the opposite of Jurassic park, Jurassic park where you bought the dinosaurs back. This would be where the dinosaurs went away. So you could do a whole theme park just based on the end of the dinosaurs. Um, and I feel like you could do a lot of cool education about dinosaurs, you know, the actual history of dinosaurs and, and things like that. But yeah, I did visit the spot where allegedly the, was the, uh, the center point of where the, the impact happened. Um, I read a book about Hegel on the beach. It's quiet there now. Uh, so yeah, that's um, no, no sign of it. No sign of it. All right. Let me, let me scroll up. <laughs> Do you think your audience would mind if you cursed? Uh, they might mind. I don't know. I try to make at least my videos, uh, you know, family friendly. Is that a thing? Family friendly as family friendly esoterica. Um, yeah, I think you can convey most of what you want to convey without cursing and being vulgar. 
Uh, I don't think cursing or being vulgar is completely bad. I do have my share of it, but I think that when I want to make, um, that when I want to make, um, 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 approachable content, I just really not do it because I'd rather my content be something that could be played in a classroom or played anywhere. And it wouldn't, it wouldn't be, I don't know, at least not offensive like that. <laughs> um, it would be offensive maybe in other ways, but it wouldn't be offensive, uh, in the sense of, uh, the curse words or whatever. So. All right. Mercurius asked, does relativism worry you? Uh, yes. Relativism is nonsense. Um, that relativism in the sense that they're, you know, that, that, um, uh, everyone has their own truth and, uh, I have my truth and you have your truth or that ethics is relative or that, uh, truth is relative. Yeah. I, I have no truck with that idea. Um, I'm not, I'm not a relativist. I'm not a postmodernist. Um, I think that there are truths in the world. I think they're real hard to get, <laughs> but, um, I mean, I think there are moral truths in the world and I think that it's our task to try to figure them out and, and live lives that are marked by those moral truths and other kinds of truths. Um, so yeah, I'm not a relativist. I don't buy that. Uh, um, I've never really, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Not interested in that. Not interested in that kind of stuff. Um, Jens ask, what makes a topic mystical? Man, that's a big question. Um, so I tend to be very different than a lot of other people who define mysticism. I think a lot of people, um, want to think of mysticism as sort of a return to a primordial one. I don't tend to frame mysticism metaphysically. So I don't think of, uh, of, I don't frame my understanding of me of what a mysticism is via uh, an appeal to metaphysics. Um, I tend to think of mysticism as, as a, uh, I tend to frame it as an appeal to epistemology, which is to say it's a way of knowing. And it's a peculiar way of knowing because it's a non-rational way of knowing, not irrational. I don't think mystics are irrational and they're not rational. They're not, they're not appealing to comparativa or logic to exhaustively describe their experience or the, or the uh, content of those experience or the propositions that might flow from it. Rather, they appeal to a non-rational form of experience and a non-rational way of coming to understand that experience and often a non-rational way of explaining it. And so in that way, uh, I tend to frame what mysticism is epistemologically rather than metaphysically. I think that separates me from most people who do work on, mes on, on mysticism. So when, when I deal with, a, when I deal with a, a mystical text, when someone asks me, what is a mystical text? I would say any text that uses a non-rational mode of, of knowing, a non-rational epistemology. And that captures a lot of weird texts. It captures a lot of weird texts, including a lot of aesthetic texts as well, surprisingly or not surprisingly. And so, um, and so I would have group a lot of things in mysticism that maybe other people wouldn't, for instance, the discovery of the benzene molecule. Now uh, the discovery of the benzene molecule was done under, uh, the effect of, um, of, um, I think it was a dream or it was done under the effect of, of psychedelic drugs. I would consider that a mystical experience. And, and the result of the understanding of the benzene molecule is fundamentally mystical. So, um, so I'm, I'm, I have a pretty, pretty wide ranging theory of what mysticism is. And I tend to put a lot more in the basket of what mysticism is, as opposed to, I think a lot of other philosophers for whom mysticism has something to do with metaphysics, which I don't think that it necessarily does. I think that one could even have mystical experiences of naturalistic things and it still would be constitutive to my, to my categories, categorization of a mystical experience. So for me, mysticism is all is mostly about uh, epistemology and not about metaphysics, um, because I think you could have a non-mystical metaphysics. In fact, many people do, many philosophers do. Um, there are plenty of non-mystical metaphysics, and there are plenty of myst mysticism that isn't that isn't metaphysical or doesn't make claims about metaphysics. So that's what I would think about this. Um, Let me see some other questions up here. Um, all right. Kuya Rick Kelly. Um, 
Thank you for the donation. What are your top five metal bands to listen to when playing a Dungeons and Dragons campaign? Oh boy. I don't know. Top five? I have Fintroll has to be up there. You have to play a lot of Fintroll. Um, yeah, play a lot of Fintroll. I think you'd probably have to get some like Wolves in the Throne Room in there. I think I'm wearing a Wolves in the Throne Room shirt underneath this vest, actually. Um, um, I think it's a lot of folk metal. I mean, I think you would just have to, I think it would be a lot of, to me, a lot of folk metal. Um, i trying to think, of, I don't listen to a lot of folk metal, but it would have to be a lot of that kind of stuff. It wouldn't be like Crawless or Liturgy. I don't think that those, those are too like heady and mathematical. But yeah, I think Fint, for whatever reason, Fintroll comes to mind uh, most clearly as what I would play for like doing D&D. &D. Um, I will say that when I was playing D&D &D more actively back before the pandemic, um, one of my, uh, one of the players uh, would uh, put on ambient music for whatever uh, was going on. So they'd have like town ambient music or dungeon ambient music or fight music. And it really, really did help. It really, really was helpful. So I love the fact that there are just all these like ambient background music that you can get on YouTube to, uh, to put on, uh, to put on your, your, uh, your thing. So that's really great. Um. Yeah, someone says do a video on late 4th century Roman paganism. Yes, in fact, there's a whole book out now that I really I wanted to get into. I was thinking about bringing it on vacation with me to read. That's called The um, the Twilight of Paganism or something like that. It just came out recently. It's supposed to be really, really good. So I'm going to be, yeah, I want to focus on some of that stuff as well. That stuff is really, really impressive. Um, um, all right, let's see some other folks. Owen, um, thoughts on the on the Commedia de Arte Cabala link? I don't know. I don't know, Owen. I'm not sure what that text is. Um, maybe you can say more about it and let me know. Um, maybe more about it. I'm not sure. I don't know what that what that text is. Um, Constellation Pegasus asks, were black cats looked upon as evil in ancient Israel the way they were in medieval times? Um I think the black cat thing is much more, I think it's more early modern, actually. Uh, cats in general being linked with the devil, I think is more of an early modern thing, and really specifically an insular thing. Uh, this whole idea of familiars is um, is really mostly an England, Ireland, Scotland thing, really mostly England and Scotland. Um, so it's really early modern, 17th century, actually, um, when you get the whole cats being lim linked with, uh, with, uh, with the devil. Uh, and witchcraft. So no, I, I think there's no evidence, in, to my knowledge, in the in ancient Israel and Hebrew Bible where, um, where any where cats are linked. I don't even think there are many discussions of cats in the Hebrew Bible in general. Um, so I think that's a really, really modern, uh, really modern uh, concept. Really, a, a 17th century concept. Would I ever do an episode uh, where I showcase some of my ancient and medieval coin collection? Um, yeah, I would. I don't have anything especially interesting, frankly. I mean, my collection is really, really meager. I'm not, you know, I don't have, um, I don't have a bunch of, I don't have a bunch of money, so I'm not collecting super rare coins. Um, um, I mean, I have a, you know, I have a Caligula, I have a, a, a coin of Caligula, but it's just a bronze os, so it's just not very uncommon. Um, but I have a couple of coins. I, I typically actually collect my medieval coins based on historical things. So I do have some interesting um, medieval coins, um, that were rulers that were from particular times where things happened, like the condemnation of Paris or the exile of 1492 and things like that. So I do have some of those and those are surprisingly affordable folks. If you want to get into collecting medieval coins, you can get really nice, uh, medieval coins, um, silver coins for 25, $30 a piece, not cheap by any means, but still really cool to be able to pick up a a coin from you know the 17th century or 15th century for 25 bucks you know, 25 bucks silver coin no less um and so yeah you can get into collecting medieval coins really accessibly uh in many ways even collecting roman coins as long as you just stick with bronze coins is still relatively accessible um but yeah i can showcase some of the coins i have but i don't have anything really interesting it's mostly what i use to um mostly what i use to teach when i'm teaching i have a coin of someone may have of uh charles the great not charles the great uh but of uh charles the second or something like that so all right let me scroll back up um 
me grab some more, some other questions. It's always impossible to get all the great questions. It's so difficult to get um, um, of course, obviously a question about DMT because there's always a question about DMT. Uh, what role of DMT played in early mysticism? None. DMT wasn't synthesized until much, much later. So very little. It's mostly Joe Rogan and his, his folks. Um, but yeah, I don't think that DMT played any role in early mysticism. I don't think it played any role in mysticism until probably the 20, late 20th century. Um, David Jimenez, have you read, or are you interested in the philosophy of uh, Franz Josenzweig? Yeah, I have read a little bit of his of his stuff. Uh, it's not really esoteric. I don't think I'd cover it on the channel, but it is super, super fascinating. Um, so, yeah, I would, um, yeah, I, I find his uh, thought to be really, really interesting. All right. Um, let me see. Let me scroll back up and see if I can get some more questions before I... It's 125. Good. Um, uh, in one of your earlier videos, you said you might answer the question in a video, what would it mean for magic to work? Could you answer that here? I couldn't um, because I, I think that when people say magic works, I think they have a huge, there's a huge array of what they mean by that quest, by, by saying that magic works. Everything from there are occult powers in the universe, i.e. something like stellar rays, and you can affect them in a, you know, and affect um, uh, you can you can do supernatural causation. You can have you can engage in supernatural causation, all the way to um, all the way to that magic is the is about attuning your consciousness. It's a it's a basically a very elaborate form of self help. Um, the the issue is, is that I could never answer whether or not magic works because the question does magic work is always predicated on what they think magic is and what they think works is. And so when people ask me, does magic work? Well, if they ask me if I believe in supernatural causation, well, the answer is no, I, I don't believe in supernatural causation. I don't think you can um, burn incense and, and and draw things on silver to make you win a horse race. I don't think that that, I don't think that those two things can cause each other. Um, now, if you ask me, do I think that engaging in magic can change someone's consciousness? Well, in as much as consciousness actually exists, sure. There's just no way that if you're a ritual or ceremonial magician and you're actively engaged in meditative be meditative behaviors and, and self-conscious, self-directed, intentional behavior, that that's not going to have a, a very strong impact on your consciousness. Uh, much less even a very positive impact on your consciousness. There's no way you're going to do the Abra Melon and come away with that, come away from that unchanged psychologically. That seems really ridiculous and impossible to me. So, so if you're asking me, does it have a psychological impact? Well, of course, how could it not? But if you're asking me, do I think that has, do I think that there is supernatural causation? No, I don't have any, I don't have very much reason to believe if any, that super, supernatural causation is real. Now, when I talk to practitioners of magic, they have a very different story to tell. And that might be because we accept very different metaphysics. We accept different worldviews. We might have a, a much a much different or much larger or much more uh, circumscribed understanding of how causality works. And so depending on your theory of causality, which is a you know, huge issue in metaphysics. So I have a very specific theory of causality. It's very circumscribed. And insofar as I have that, well, that might mean that that, it, that there's no explanation that's going to be allowable for some so-called supernatural causation. So uh, the, the, when people ask, um, what would it mean for magic to work? The question always hinges to me on very tight definitions of magic, which are hard to get at, very hard to get at, and also very tight definitions of work. And so when people say things work, what I need is... And when I say things work, I have to be very uh, explicit about what I mean. And there we're having a very, a very tight, very complicated conversation about the metaphysics of causation. And that is a very complicated task. It's a very complicated conversation in, in just contemporary metaphysics about what causation is and if it is, right? There's the classic, you know, stuff from Hume and Kant about do we really even know that causation is happening? If there is a such thing as it. So I'm 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 much more interested in 
I'm less interested, I guess I could say, in does magic work? I'm much more interested in listening to practitioners have that conversation with each other. And then me as a philosopher asking questions to better understand what they mean. So that's what I'm where I would fit into that more, more so, I think. Um, more so than just, you know, putting it out there. But because I'm very skeptical of psychology, like I, I'm skeptical that minds exist. I'm 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 not convinced there are minds. Um, especially not substance substance minds. Um, and I'm very skeptical of especially supernatural causation. Um and so I'm less interested in telling people what does and doesn't work. I'm more interested in hearing how people understand magic to work and then having um, careful philosophical conversations about what that might reveal about their philosophical commitments, especially in terms of their theory of mind or their theory of, of metaphysics, their, their, uh, their uh, theory of causation. So, <clears throat> all right, let me scroll back up and see uh, some other questions if I can. Um, now this is great stuff about the, um, do you, uh, so Taurus Cronus asks, do you have any opinions on the Mayan calendar, i.e. timekeeping system, as opposed to our calendar and other timekeeping systems? Um, I guess the one thing I would say about the Mayan timekeeping system is that one, there's not one there, there, there are at least four, um, that are interconnected. Right. Um, and so they're the mind timekeeping system, the mind calendar is really impressive in that they were able to generate basically f four interlocking systems that were able to keep very, very specific dates. Um, so on the one hand, it's very interesting and very elaborate. On the one hand, on the other hand, there's this really weird pernicious myth that it's somehow more accurate than our calendar. My calendar is less accurate than our calendar. The Gregorian calendar is very accurate, all things told. Uh, it, but now what's interesting is that not only was the mind calendar less accurate than our calendar, they knew it. They knew their calendar had problems and they corrected for them. They actually tried to fix them and they were, uh, they basically you know, had to fudge some math to get it to work. So it, again, I hate, I hate it's a strong word. I dislike mythologizing indigenous people by either making them savages, which is obviously not true, but also making them somehow metaphysical geniuses that are beyond reproach. That's also fetishization that doesn't take them seriously. And there's no more ridiculous example of that than the whole 2012 fiasco where everyone believed, people believed for whatever demented reasons that somehow the minds predicted the end of the world because the calendar is going to roll over to a new cartoon. Um, the mind had larger numbers in Katun, but in the Baktuns, right? The 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 bigger Baktun, they had they had Paktuns that were even bigger. Uh, there are dates in the mind calendar that go off millions of years from now. Uh, I think that the the my complaint about that stuff is that fetishizing indigenous people just always doesn't see them. It's just mostly about white people either trying to dismiss them or make them magical, and they're neither. Indigenous people have their own geniuses and their own shortcomings, and the Mayan calendar has its its, its own particular genius. I um, mean, the 270 system, the 100, 270 day calendar is really, really impressive. The Venus counting system is really, really interesting. The counting by the phases of Venus and stuff like that's very, very fascinating. But the Mayan calendar is not any more correct than our calendar. In fact, our calendar is pretty good. Um, in fact. There are even better calendars than our calendar, right? Uh, the atomic calendars are way better now. Um, so, yeah, I might guess my thought about the Mayan calendar and the Mayan counting system is just that we should let it be what it is and don't let it be less and don't let it be more. Um, so we don't get in situations where we have a bunch of people coming to Chichen Itza in December of 2012 waiting for the world to end uh, when all that happened was the long count just got one cycle longer, one more back to enrolled over. Um, so yeah, I find that stuff to be, it's embarrassing <laughs> mostly, but, uh, we respect people, uh, indigenous people. We, 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 we respect indigenous people, respect ancient people, respect medieval people, not by fetishizing them, but by understanding them and understanding them means appreciating what they got right. And then also realizing that they didn't get a lot right. Um, which they didn't. So, and that's fine. That's fine. Um, all right. Let me scroll back up and see if I can get some more 
will I be doing any more content on the intersection of um, magic, uh, math math mathematics, and religion? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I'll definitely be doing more content on um, math and religion. Um, it's a super interesting topic. C calendars, just like to mention the the Maya stuff from a minute ago. I'm always really interested in calendars. I want to do an episode on the Enoch calendar, the Enochian calendar found in um, in um, if, well, one Enoch which I think is really, really fascinating. So, yeah. But yeah, absolutely. Mathematics is really, really fascinating in its relationship to, uh, in its relationship to religion. Um, do you think it's possible to glimpse a proto-Indo-European or proto-Semitic mythology from comparative religion? This is where I'm going to get myself in a bunch of trouble. <laughs> I don't like comparative religion. I think comparative religion is mostly bad and mostly wrong. Um, like the Joseph Campbell stuff, I think that, that stuff is bad science, bad religion. The I think the only way, uh, I'm not going to say only way, the most productive way to get access to Proto-Indo-European religion or Proto-Semitic religion maybe is is through language. And there have been really, really great reconstructions of Proto-Indo-European, uh, Proto, uh, Proto at least, not Proto-Semitic which we can derive some aspects of their world from the language. And I, I, I am much more inclined to go the route of the science of linguistics than I think the, the, and the, the imagination of comparative religion. Uh, comparative religion, I, I think I often find just to be a mess. And part of what I find to be a mess is that because there's this, there's a, there's a, and Jay-Z Smith talks about this, just because there are similarities doesn't mean there's any connection. P and people independently come up with connections, uh, with similar, I similar ideas all the time. There's no connection whatsoever, but there's a weird desire on the part of people to make a connection and therefore to claim that, well, because Meister Eckhart kind of thought in a non-dual way that he must've had some connection to the Upanishads. No. No, there's no reason to believe that, or that Spinoza believed this, therefore he had to have some connection to, to this, or you know Spinoza believed this, and it's kind of like Kabbalah, so therefore he must have been influenced by Kabbalah. Maybe, maybe not. Um, so I don't know. I'm very pessimistic about the possibilities of comparative religion. Um, I'm pretty pessimistic about the possibilities of that doing that of comparativa in general. I think that there are structural homologies, and I think that looking at those homologies is interesting. But without having very strong evidence for causal connections, those are just homologies. They're just homologies. And now homological analysis is interesting, but it's not comparativa in the sense that one can, can do this. So I'm, I'm pretty skeptical of, of the possibilities of, of comparative religion. I know that's going to make a bunch of people angry. And I think that like, it's a relatively controversial position, but I'm relatively skeptical of of the what can be gained from from that kind of thing. All right. Um, let's see. Um, have I ever worked with key? Um, no. I don't think that there is such a thing. I mean, aside from in the literature about it, but I don't think that that, that it exists. Um. Did you talk to anyone in Mexico about contemporary esoteric practice thinking? No, I did not. Um, the Astro Gypsy, the, and the reason why is very, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, one, I was there on vacation. <laughs> so vacation's vacation. I really did not want to go there and do work. Um, two, I think that's more of a task for an anthropologist. And three, I need to learn, I need to actually understand Spanish uh, and, and uh, Yucatec Maya uh, to do that effectively. And I don't, I'm not, I don't have Spanish. I certainly don't have Yucatec Maya. Um, so no, no. And I think that'd be more of a task for an anthropologist um, than it would be the, you know, for me to be doing that from a philosophical standpoint, but it'd be cool to work on that kind of stuff and read about it. But no, I did not do it. I did not do it. I was there to basically uh, just go down there and uh, see some of the history I've read so much about. And um, yeah, I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Um, what do you think of the later Heidegger's work, uh, later Heidegger's work on the pre-Socratics and his recovery of the fourfold from the multiplicity of being? Oh God, 
how you usually to work. And so when he starts spelling being with a Y, uh, Dasein or whatever with a uh, with a Y, um, what do I think about the later Heidegger work? I think the later Heidegger work is basically mysticism. <laughs> um, I really do think that the later Heidegger, all the later Heidegger stuff, uh, most of the stuff after being in time uh, is mysticism. And I don't mean that to be dismissive of it. I think that's fine. Mysticism is totally fine. Obviously, I study mysticism. But I don't think he's, I, 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 whatever Heidegger's up to and his later works is very, very, very uh, mystical, very esoteric. And um, it's fun to read. I mean, his stuff on Parmenides is mind blowing. Um, but yeah, I don't think that there's something else going on there. Now, is he recovering the truth of being, the thinking of being from, you know, from the eliminating the ontotheology and getting past, uh, getting back behind? Aristotle? No, of course he is not. That's ridiculous. I don't think that there was some primitive thinking of being in, um, in Parmenides or whatever. Uh, but he is doing really incredible, qua you know, mystical, quasi-mystical philosophy in his later works. And again, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't accept his conclusions, but I think his work is rather amazing. Um, so yeah, I have a great respect for Heidegger as a philosopher and as a mystic. Uh, I have no respect for him as a person, but, um, but yeah, that's great stuff, and it's really hard to read and really worth reading. If folks want, want uh, um, folks want to do this, what is your favorite mythological being? If you don't mind sharing, who is my favorite mythological being? Yeah, probably Yahweh. Yahweh is a pretty interesting mythological being. Now I'm kind of biased, obviously, but um, what I'm what, and I guess what I'll say about. Um, about Yahweh, when I'm interested in, in in Yahweh, is how little we know about Yahweh. That this that this being, um, this super this mythological being, has gone to become the dominant god in the world. Basically, this is the most popular god, either via Jesus or via Allah. That this being Yahweh has hugely disproportionately affected history, despite the fact that we know very little about the origins of this of this entity. Uh, assuming that, you know, again, entity in the mythological sense of the word. And I'm really interested in it. Like I said, when I do a, uh, an episode on uh, on Yahweh here in, in the next little while, one of the things I'll be interested in doing is looking at the origins of this of this being and the, and the debates around where this being may have come from and also how Yahweh was um, assimilated into Israelite, Canaanite religious practices and eventually becomes the God of the Hebrew Bible the God of the monarchy, the God of Christianity and the God of Islam. Um, so I find Yahweh to be terribly interesting just because this being is so incredibly adaptable, uh, probably beginning their existence as a cyanitic warrior God, and then eventually being adapted into a storm God and all kinds of other gods, uh, and eventually becoming the father of the son and the Holy spirit and, and Allah and everything else. So the, the adaptability of Yahweh just, positively fascinates me that this being could go from a cyanitic warrior god uh to the god of the kabbalah that blows my mind no god has has proven to be as as protean as as yahweh and so i'm curious about the history and development of yahweh as a mythological entity and especially the the origins of this of this being this mythological creature so yeah, so I'm curious. I'm really fascinated by Yahweh um, as a as a mythological entity, and so yeah, I'll be covering Yahweh pretty soon. Pretty soon. Pretty soon. Let me scroll back down. Um. Um. Yeah, yeah. Francois Lurel does really cool stuff. Um. Yep. Um, he has some great books and they're translated to English too. And they're good. They're solid. They're really popular, accessible. I have a couple of them. So yeah. Um, yeah, his works are really, really accessible and nice. So I'll be, um, yeah, they're really great. They're worth, uh, worth reading. Have I read the Kabbalion? Yes. Um, any thoughts on that piece? It's interesting. New age thought. It's not hermeticism really. Um, uh, but it is interesting. New age thought. Um, so I, I think it's interesting on its own as part of the new thought movement and the rise of the new age movement. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not convinced that it's a hermetic text by any, whatever hermetic means. Although Dan Atrell over the modern hermetica, um, the modern hermeticist 
has uh, some interesting uh, interesting things to say about about that. And um, it's it's interesting. I'll do an episode on it at some point. But yeah, it's it's certainly interesting for its impact. That's for sure. Uh, for its impact. Um, um, yeah, but yeah, yeah, I'm I'm Jewish, and just because I'm Jewish doesn't mean that I take my doesn't mean that I take my uh, my mythology literally. I take my mythology very seriously. I don't take it literally. <laughs> um, those are very distinct things. Uh, um, yeah, Christian Evans, the, that book is the Twilight of Paganism. That's right. That's the name of the book that I was think, trying to think of. Um, yep, that is a that was a um, so. Let me see. Um, yeah, there's a theory that, that there's an episode about the about the idea that Yahweh is a dragon. There's no evidence of Yahweh is a dragon. Um, y'all, the earliest references to Yahweh were always as a warrior god. So that it was always a always a warrior god. It just changed once it was. Uh, I'll okay, so I'll do an episode about it soon. So yeah, look for the episode on. Um, um, look for an episode on the origins of of Yahweh. In a little while. Also, the people that really hate Yahweh is also really fascinating to me. The anti Yahwists. Um, there's a whole, there's a whole like subculture, I think, on the internet of like Yahweh hating people, um, which is always interesting. I think it's tongue in cheek and ironic mostly. Um, but it, it's interesting that they, that, that the, they dislike Yahweh, but I feel like they, I've never heard really any good evidence they've studied this God very deeply. Now, more people know more about um, Zeus or Odin. Than, than Yahweh. And the reason why is because the stories about Yahweh are very hard to come by. This God is very, very ambiguous. Um, so uh, and it's not a flashy God. Um, and one of the things I'll talk about is unlike uh, other gods, and Yahweh never makes appearances in terms of visible appearance and doesn't die like other gods and doesn't come back from the dead like other gods, doesn't reveal, um, um, doesn't reveal secret knowledge typically. Um, doesn't have sex with other beings uh, like most gods. He always a very unusual god in this regard, very unlike Zeus and things like this. So, but yep, um, we'll definitely get to Yahweh soon. We're best buds, me and Yahweh. All right. Um, What about Yahweh's wife Asherah? Well, there's a lot of debate about whether or not uh, whether or not God had a wife, the Asherah. We do know that uh, we know there's an, uh, there's a couple of inscriptions that mention Yahweh's Asherah, but the grammar there is very weird, and so it may be the symbol the Asherah and not the woman, not the goddess Asherah. Those are very different things. Um, and there may have been some worship of Yahweh uh, with a consort early on, but I think that that there's, there's good evidence that wasn't the um, that wasn't the case. Um, um, yeah, the Mark Smith book is not readable to a, a broader audience. That's why I'll make an episode about it at some point. Uh, it is a tough, tough text. Uh, but I mean, just the, the wealth of stuff and the notes is just so worth it. Um, <coughs> what do you think about Jijik's Christian atheism and also how does Bataille's notion of sacrifice and consumption, um, um, after Marx's view on the theory, labor theory of value. Um, well, I, I think that one, I think that Jijik's idea of Christian atheism is really, really fascinating. I think it's possible. Um, um, so yeah, I think that that's certainly possible. And I think it's interesting. I think that his Hegelian version of Christian atheism is really fascinating. Um, I still find the supersessionistic aspect of it to be a, 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 a kind of ridiculous, but whatever. I think it's pretty interesting. Um, but, um, the other aspect of Bataille's notion of sacrifice, I think that, I think that they're basically compatible. I actually think that Bataille's notion of sacrifice and Marx's theory of, uh, labor theory of value are actually, uh, are, are, they are reconcilable. And in fact, one of the arguments that I've made is that one of the things that capitalism does terribly, uh, is that it destroys sacrifice that capitalism sacrifices sacrifice. And one of the arguments that I've made is that um, part of what capitalism does, is it doesn't take religion and then distort it, is that it destroys the, the fundamental religious impulse, which is the, the sacrificial impulse. 
because in capitalism, everything is a mercantile business. You have to, uh, things are about generating profit and therefore waste is something to be eliminated as opposed to something to be celebrated uh, intentionally in wasting things. So I've made an argument and I have a, I've did a presentation about this and maybe I'll dig it up at some point, maybe not. But I think that Bataille adds something very important that Marx missed. Marx misses a lot of things in his critique of capitalism. And one of the things I've argued is that um, capitalism dis distorts waste in a way that isn't productive. That but the Bataille notion of waste is productive waste. And that can't be grasped to capitalism because commodities are only the only thing capitalism understands. And commodities um commodities it can produce waste but it, it produces waste as waste not as uh, not as a production because it, again it can't it, waste can never be commodified and so um so i think that that bataille gives us something interesting that marx can't because marx is he's kind of a philistine when it comes to religion he doesn't get it at all he, he doesn't get it at all. And I think Bataille gets it way better than he does. So I think he's a better Marxist in that way than Marx was. Um, so, but I'll make, maybe make an episode about that at some point. I don't know. Um, all right. So highbrow dude, I missed your college entry intro to Western esotericism. Will you host another class? If not, we're going to sign up. So you didn't miss it. I haven't done it. Um, this channel is kind of it, but I will be doing eventually a, a, a sort of class level introduction to esotericism. So Western esotericism, at least. <coughs> um, so I will be getting to it eventually. Um, maybe some, maybe some, maybe some point this summer or something, maybe. Um, but yeah, look for that. That, that will become, that will be, uh, that will be coming down the pike at some point, uh, at some point soon. And uh, yeah, I really want to do that too. It really is a lot of fun to do a, long form esotericism, uh, Western esotericism class. How do you get the training for historical research and writing without going to graduate school? Um, that's a good question. And that's a hard question. Um, you can't easily the, the, because part of the best way of getting that training is by just doing it, which means actually really writing out, um, really writing out the, um, doing the writing. I mean, trying to do the research and do the writing. And I think that the way that one does that, that one does that is by, uh, learning the ropes by submitting your research to academic journals or presenting it in the public. Um, and when you're not rigorous, people will let you know. So it's very, very difficult to, to do it on your own. But I don't think that there's any kind of inherent barrier to becoming a rigorous, uh, critical thinking person without having to, um, without having to be in the the academy. I don't think one needs to be in the academy to do that. Um, I think that you you look for evidence, you do the research, and you make arguments that are based on evidence and reason. And if you do that, if you look at the research, you grasp the research. You make uh, you make arguments based on uh, evidence and reason. That's it. You're doing it. I don't think you have to do anything other than that. Um, and again, you know, I, the format of this channel, for instance, is different than uh, Dr. Angela Puka's um, uh, symposium. Hers is much more. Hers is her content is much more academically inclined, and I think that's really, really, really good. And I really uh, appreciate her for doing that. Mine is uh, is also academically aligned, but I'm not doing it in the way that of like quoting my sources and things in the footnotes. And so um, we do scholarly work, although in very different ways, but both of us are doing basically academic work. And just shows you there's a range of how this is can be done and a range of how this can be done in an, accept in an acceptable, um, rigorous way. So don't let anyone tell you that you've got to go to graduate school or you got to pay a bunch of money to, to do this, to do, uh, to do, uh, academically rigorous work or rigorous scholarly work um, uh, at all. So you do not have to do that. All right. Let me get a couple more questions before I, I sign off for the day. Um, I sign off for the day. All right. Um,
Let's see. What the folks are talking about Yahweh. Well, let me see. Well, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the chat. Wow. Let's see. Let's scroll back up and grab a couple more questions. Doesn't Yahweh become the dying and reviving God in Christ Jesus? Yeah, that's that's certainly a that's certainly a thing that that uh, that uh, Christianity uh, really really did well and vis-a-vis interacting with paganism, um, with uh, with sort of non yahwistic beliefs. I mean, one thing that that the the Hebrew Bible repeatedly mentions is that Yahweh cannot die, um, and you know that's different than Baal, who, who of course died and came back from the dead. Um, and the the you know that the idea that that Jesus died and came back was very attractive. You know, again, you have Mithras cult and Osiris and all kinds of other gods that come back, and that's part of the reason why I think that one of the many reasons why the Jesus uh, the Jesus movement never made sense to to Jews. Like, no, like we don't know. Like, we don't want a dead god, a dying god. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's a part of the reason why I just did not catch on, or one of the reasons, a many reasons, but that's one. Um, that is one. Um, uh, would I call myself a Jewish mystic? No. No. No, no, no. Did you ever go to Frisia since you're visiting the Netherlands? No, I never did. I would. I got up to Groningen, near Groningen, and I got to visit some of the really cool Hunnebedden, the, 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 uh, the Stone Age burial sites that are sort of they potmark uh, the the Netherlands and all parts of Germany and stuff. And there's a great list of all these Hunnebedden that you can go visit, and they're numbered. And so I visited um, some of the Hunnebedden um, um, with a, a wonderful one I was dating at the time. And um, yes, yeah, so we got to visit some of the Hunnebedden up near Haren and Groningen. But I never visited Frisia. I'd love to visit Frisia. Uh, it's just a super interesting part of the world. And listening to Frisian language is just really, really fascinating. Um, just because it's sort of closer to English. Um, all right. Dinosaurs are fake. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the donation. Hell Mage, it's a pretty epic name. Um, Um, was uh, Plato an alchemist? No, alchemy had not been invented yet. Uh, it was in the process of being invented over in in, in Egypt, but it was still several hundred years, uh, still still several hundred years out before before uh, before before Plato was uh, before Plato was, or after Plato was writing after after. All right. Can you recommend a reading list for occultists that are looking to learn more about the origin of the practice of Kabbalah? Um, Basically, if you take a look at any of my Kabbalah episodes, I have a bunch of episodes in the Kabbalah. I have tons of recommendations for reading. So yeah, if if you're wanting recommendations for any specific topic in Kabbalah that I've covered so far, uh, you can look at basically any of the episodes I've done on topics in Kabbalah, and I always give a, a pretty good, I think a pretty good, a, you know, I give a reading list. So um, so those are absolutely there if you want to check a look at those. Um. All right. Um, all right. Wow, art and philosophy. Wow, you guys ask such huge questions for reading lists, man. Um, yeah, the, uh, I don't have one for art and philosophy, but I'm sure you could sure you could look up any sort of intro aesthetics, uh, intro aesthetics thing on the internet and find a pretty good list. Um, all right, folks, I think that I might sign off. I think I might sign off for the day. Um, um, I really en- I've really enjoyed hanging out. Um, um, this has been really great. I really just want to say, uh, as, as, um, as I really deeply feel it, I uh, really appreciate all of you for uh, taking the time to hang out with me on a Friday afternoon to talk about esotericism. Really appreciate you taking the time 
to uh, you know the, to you know view the contents of the channel and and just you know support the work of making this kind of stuff available. Um, you know, either by sharing the content, hanging out, asking questions, having these great live streams, um, donating to the channel. I really appreciate all of it. It really means a ton to me and I'm deeply, deeply appreciative of it. Uh, and we'll have another live stream. Uh, like I said, from now on, uh, we'll have uh, three episodes and a live stream. That's the way that there'll be three new episodes of content in the live stream. And that, that'll be the future of the channel, at least for the, for the little while. So again, thank you. Um, Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for uh, hanging out. Uh, thank you so much for supporting the the channel. Thank you so much for uh, your thoughtful questions. And I uh, hope everyone has a great uh, has a great afternoon, great day. If you observe uh, the Shabbat, hope you have a, a really great rest. And if you don't, hope you find some rest just the same. So, um, yeah, thank you all, and I will I'll I'll be here next week for. Uh, Austin Osman Spar. So if you're interested in Chaos Magic and Austin Osman Spar, I will see you um, see you next week. You guys have a great night. Have a great evening, and I will see all of you soon. Thank you so much. <laughs>